evacuated, virtually the entire population of Chernobyl. But even that may not help. Wind conditions are swirling the radioactive cloud throughout the Soviet Union. Even in Sweden, 1,000 miles away, unusually high radiation levels are being detected. I'm absolutely certain there was a meltdown. There's no question about that. Polish television is treating the threat more seriously and more publicly than Moscow. The Warsaw government says children in many places must stop drinking milk from cows which could be contaminated and to pass out iodine capsules to help prevent thyroid cancer caused by excess radiation. The radioactive dust could contaminate not only the watershed there, which serves more than five million people, it could also poison the Ukrainian wheat fields, which feed most of the USSR. Again, the official word from Moscow, only two people have died. But that is something one high-ranking White House official dismisses as, in his words, clearly preposterous. Colleen, a nuclear cloud is expected to drift over the northwestern United States by this weekend, but energy officials here insist there's no danger from fallout. With the Soviets now asking for help fighting an atomic fire, experts here say the problem at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant may be much worse than a meltdown. What are the chances of a meltdown happening here? Channel 2's Warren Alney reports. U.S. experts think this is what's happening now. The graphite core of the Russian reactor is on fire, spewing radiation into the air. They insist we on the west coast of the United States don't have to worry. The best analogy I could give you would be uh, similar to what happened during the weapons testing in the late 50s, early 60s, when we had the nuclear tests in the South Pacific. By the time the radiation cloud moved around the Earth, it was very, very dilute. In California, there are three big nuclear power installations, San Onofre in San Diego County, Diablo Canyon on the Central Coast, Rancho Seco near Sacramento. Experts say that while there could be a meltdown, there could not be a disaster like the one in the Soviet Union. Our basic philosophy in the United States has been the so-called philosophy of defense in depth, where you put money into safety systems to prevent accidents, and then you put money into systems to mitigate against accidents should the accident occur. This drawing shows how a meltdown occurs when cooling water is accidentally removed from around the nuclear fuel at the core of a power reactor. There is no control of the atomic reaction. The fuel gets so hot that it melts like a candle all the way through the stain that surrounds it and onto the floor below. In this country, most of the radiation released when that happens should be kept inside the enormous steel and concrete domes that surround the reactor. Soviet reactors don't have those domes, and that's why radiation is escaping now, with awful consequences. It would be acute radiation sickness. Uh, I think that's been described as uh, people looking like they've been severely burnt, uh, people uh, onset of nausea, and uh, an overall systemic breakdown of the human body. The first U.S. meltdown was in 1959, just west of Chatsworth in the Santa Susana Mountains. The reactor was tiny compared to today's big power plants, but there was a release of radiation. The public was not told the details till 1979, 20 years later. That was just after the second incident at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. That was a partial meltdown, and while some radiation was released, most was held inside the containment building. We saw that at Three Mile Island, the preventive part broke down, but the mitigative part held up. The containment held up very well at Three Mile Island. The Union of Concerned Scientists says that there are five nuclear plants in the United States that do not have containment structures, one in Washington State at Hanford, four in South Carolina at Savannah River. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission says the chances of a meltdown at one of this nation's many reactors by the end of the century are about 45 to 50 percent. There was an immediate reaction on Wall Street today. It uh, sure was. Nuclear stocks uh, and uh, utility, utility stocks immediately uh, responded yeah. to this, so there is at least the fear that this could happen. Well, of course there is, and uh, another interesting thing that's going on is that the nuclear industry has been going before the Congress and attempting to uh, get less regulation than it has had in the past. Based on a good safety record. That's exactly right, and it'll be very interesting to see the impact on that combined with whatever economic uh, response there might be. Warren, the scientists you talked with, do they think that 40 to 50 percent chance of a meltdown in the next... find that acceptable? Good. Working to get it changed. 
Well, I don't think there's anything you can do to change it. The, these are thought to be the odds of uh, having a meltdown. They're also the same, roughly the same odds that there won't be one. Uh, whether it's acceptable or not, I think, really depends on but your own personal point of view. But you talked about five reactors that are about the same as, have the same safety well, standards. They, they don't have containment so structures they, on them. Yeah, will they, is there something they can do to make those safer? Will they put containment structures around I them? imagine that that would be possible. Whether that's planned or not, I don't know. It would be enormously expensive. No doubt this, this accident will certainly call more attention to them. Thank you, Warren. What the uh, Soviet nuclear accident does is focus a lot of attention on the U.S. nuclear power plants and the people who live nearby. The closest plant to Los Angeles is in San Onofre. Our Patty Ecker is there now with a live report. Patty? Well, Colleen, Southern California Edison people say that it's business as usual here at San Onofre. Two of the huge reactors behind us are shut down right now for routine refueling, and they're expected to start up in June. The third reactor is online in full power. And inside the offices, the officials here are watching the news out of Russia very, very carefully. I'm very concerned. Um, as a professional engineer in general, and certainly as a manager in the nuclear power field also, it's the uh, type of incident which you would never like to occur. But Dick Rosenblum said he is not concerned about San Onofre, where he is manager of nuclear safety. Rosenblum insists a nuclear accident like the one in Russia could never happen at this plant. U.S. nuclear technology is different, he says. They do not have a containment building as we do. They do not have an eight-inch thick reactor vessel within which the core is contained as we do. And the number of safety systems they have is dramatically less. So they follow a um, less stringent path than we do, and this sort of thing simply can occur. Rosenblum says there's no way the San Onofre reactors could explode or burn, as it appears the Russian ones have. And he says people who work here and live nearby need not worry. In nearby San Clemente, people who have shared the seacoast with the huge nuclear power plant for years told us that the Russian accident did not give them second thoughts. But most said they do not live without fear. I've always had some reservations about nuclear power. And I just hate to see us put all our stock in that. I'd like to see us, especially here in Southern California, um, look towards solar power. I've known people who work at, nuclear, at the nuclear power plant. And I feel that, uh, that the, their safety is not always of uh, first concern to, to, the, to the company and to the and to the people in general. Well, nuclear power, besides coal burning and the other areas that you could go in, I think uh, nuclear power is the, the safest. We are two miles from San Clemente, right here at San Onofre. When all three reactors are working, it can generate enough power for over a million households. One interesting note here, the nuclear experts inside said they're getting all their information the same way everyone else is, from news reports and wire services. There is an international network for nuclear scientists, but Russia does not participate, so they're watching in the same way we are. This is Patty Ecker reporting live. Now back to you, Jess and Colleen. Thank you, Patty. To recap, here is what we know right now about the nuclear di disaster near Kiev. There are unconfirmed reports that more than 2,000 people are dead, although the Sov Soviets still say the official death toll is two. Thousands of people were evacuated to Kiev from towns nearest the plant. The main hospital in Kiev is reportedly filled with people suffering radiation sickness. U.S. officials say the nuclear reactor is still on fire, graphite burning at 4,000 degrees. There is a danger the Kiev water supply could be contaminated. Prevailing winds are sending the nuclear cloud from the plant back over the USSR before it disperses worldwide. Particles are expected here by the weekend, but no danger is anticipated. And of course, just we should mention that a little later in this newscast, we'll have an expert on who can talk a little bit more about uh, that nuclear power accident in the Soviet Union. In the meantime, here live at 5, we have a report scheduled from downtown Los Angeles, the scene of that disastrous fire at the library this afternoon. Stay with us. There's much more still ahead. The stars are going to twinkle and shine. How oh, they'll shine this evening about a quarter to nine. My loving eyes. They say time is what you make it. At Citizen, we prefer making it beautiful. Around you, 
around a quarter to nine. Citizen at the Broadway. Red Hot Off-Road Super Action is coming at a discount. Brought to you by Mickey Thompson and your Southern California Toyota dealers. See Toyota champion drivers Ivan Stewart and Steve Millen battle door to door with the world's top sport trucks. Plus funny cars, ATVs, motocross, and more. Save on admission with a Toyota Super Ticket only from your participating Southern California Toyota dealer. It's your chance to win a new 4x4 SR5 sport truck. Get your Toyota Super Ticket and catch the action now. Rose Bowl, May 3rd, 6.30 p.m. Presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers. Two on the Town previews the fair. On Friday, May 2nd, Expo 86 opens in Vancouver, British Columbia. On Thursday, May 1st, the day before the world arrives, Two on the Town will preview the fair of the decade. Pavilions from more than 80 countries showcase the latest technology that will launch man into the tree. Expo 86 via satellite from Vancouver on Two on the Town, Thursday at 7.30 on Channel 2. For years now, Bank of America has been taking home equity loan rates in the right direction, lower. So if you need a loan for home improvement or that trip you've always dreamed of, remember, B of A's rates are lower. Where am I headed with all this? Let me get straight to the point. If you want a home equity loan or another kind of low-rate loan, we want the job. Bank of America. We have more now on that disastrous library we told you about at the top of our newscast. Live picture from Chopper 2. It shows exactly what is happening there right now in downtown Los Angeles. At this moment, the Central Los Angeles Public Library looks to be a smoldering wreck. Ann Curry has been on the scene since it started shortly before noon. She joins us now with a live report. And I guess the first question everyone has is, is it a total loss? I'm talking about the books inside, the two million or so volumes. It's too early to tell you, Colleen, but they're saying there has been significant damage, very significant damage on the second and third floors and in the attic, and the fire is still going on. What you are seeing is a cultural monument of the city of Los Angeles going up in smoke. Now, from the ground, we can tell you it is still burning, even though it started five and a half hours ago. Now, the suspected origin is in a book storage area on the second floor. From there, authorities say the fire spread to the third floor and to the attic. Now, librarians say those areas contain irreplaceable books and documents. More than 250 firemen raced to the scene and found a fire so hot, the water from their fire hoses turned to steam almost immediately. Firemen who had gone inside told us they had tried to save the books, but smoke made that extremely difficult. Here's spokesman Ed Reed. Because it doesn't do any good to just indiscriminately squirt water around. With the heavy smoke, it takes some time to find that fire, make sure that you're putting water on the fire itself and not destroying and damaging uh, library, books, magazines, some of which are very, very valuable. Reed also told us that 15 firemen were injured, suffering heat exhaustion and minor burns. One civilian was also injured when she stumbled over some fire hoses and fell. We're told that she was taken to a local hospital. Now, a few moments ago, Mayor Tom Bradley arrived and called the fire a tragedy. His office reports the mayor flew over the scene in a helicopter today and canceled several meetings because of his concern. That's the details now. We'll have more for you at 6 o'clock. Now back to you, Jess and Colleen. The big question everyone has, Anne, and looking at it from the exterior, except for the smoke pouring from it and the flames in, in the windows, it looks as though that grand old building has withstood this, uh, this inferno. Is the, is the building badly damaged? Can we tell? I can tell that there is substantial damage, but the majority of the damage, we're told, is actually to the materials inside, to the books and documents that were stored inside. The reason is that we're told that the fire started in an area where there were a lot of books, and that area acts as sort of a flue to the upper stories where there are more books. So it became kind of a tunnel of heat and smoke with books. Uh, at about 1 o'clock, 1.30, uh, the smoke turned black, and that, we were told, meant that the fire was starting to burn the the building and that has been since 1 30 1 o'clock 1 30 and it is already what five o'clock now after yeah. five well clearly in a fire like this the greater loss would be the loss of the contents as opposed to the building although that is an extraordinary building one there's been a great effort to 
suburb in the city of Los Angeles. Exactly. It is a building. It is, uh, was built in 1926. It has been declared an historic monument, uh, a cultural monument in the city of Los Angeles. Actually, a historic. it's on the register of historic places. And uh, it is a significant, the building is significant, but yes, as you say, it's materials inside, some of which we're told are irreplaceable. Sure. And there's a great deal of worry about the water damage as well as the fire damage. And you talk about the fire is spiraling up. We heard reports that uh, the roof was so hot that when the firemen hit it with water, a lot of them suffered steam burns. That's exactly right. The the, they would turn on the hoses, and the water, is almost immediately after leaving the hoses, would turn to steam. And that's why any of the firemen suffered steam burns. Thank you, Ann. You're welcome. Tonight, there is a break in the case of Marie Malgren. She is uh, the Braille woman who's been weak. Ms. Malgren's car was near Cal State University Fullerton, and there was the body of a woman inside. Channel 2's Dave Lopez has details. When last seen, 38-year-old Marie Malmgreen was leaving her Brea house in the family's 1981 El Dorado Cadillac with a personalized license plate B-I-G-E-14. That was last Tuesday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Then the mother of two teenage children disappeared. This morning, Fullerton police patrol officer went out specifically looking for the car. He found it in this parking lot. In the back seat, on the floor, the officer saw what looked like a body wrapped in a blanket. At this time, you cannot make a positive ID. No, we cannot. There's no way of knowing how long the body has been there, how long the car's been there? No, nope, not at this particular time. The woman's husband, Sergeant Russ Malmgreen of the LAPD, once worked the anti-terrorist detail. For that reason, police searched for hours, fearing that the car might be booby-trapped. The bomb squad was called in, along with the dog, but no bomb was found. The door was finally opened with a clothes hanger. Inside, the body of a woman. Badly decomposed, positive ID, impossible to determine. At this point, from what you've seen and what you know, there's definitely foul play. I'd be hesitant to really say that at this point because we really haven't had an, uh, an opportunity to examine the body thoroughly, and that's going to be done by the coroner's office, and we'll know better then. Nearly six hours after the discovery of the car, police had the Cadillac, with the body still inside, towed to the Orange County Coroner's Office. There, it will be determined if the body is that of Marie Malmgren. Dave Lopez, Channel 2 News, Fullerton. Officials say they'll have to use fingerprints and dental records to determine whether the body is that of the missing woman. Her car has been in that uh, parking lot near Cal State Fullerton for at least two days. When we continue, the president in Bali. You want how much for car insurance? Uh, my insurance rates will be what? Oh. Harry, we just got our car insurance quote. Don't be upset. Public insurance has some of the lowest rates for drivers who have had problems. We'll even finance your policy. We want to help, so give us a call. At Public Insurance Service, it's no problem. For KJOY Radio, singer, composer, Paul Anka. Seasons change. So do we remember, K-Joy remember the times of your life. Do you remember, K-Joy does, the times of your life. K-Joy FM 99, because these are the times of your life. If finding parking this week is incredibly easy, and getting good seats at the ballpark is a breeze. It's probably because you're the only ones who aren't at Circuit City's Red, White, and Blue Sale with great savings in every Circuit City store. Save now on a sharp VHS VCR with multi-event programming, just $258. So if there's lots of elbow room at the movies, it's because everyone's saving at Circuit City's Red, White, and Blue Sale, and you're not. Right now at Carpeteria, you can practically carpet your entire home for what you thought you'd pay for one room. Imagine five rooms of luxurious carpeting of Anso 4 Nylon for as low as $9.37. Soil and stain resistant, these carpets of Anso 4 Nylon have a full five-year warranty. And right now, you can get five rooms installed for as low as $9.37. Carpeteria's Carpet Your Entire Home event. It's more than a sale, it's a steal. Carpeteria! President Reagan is in Indonesia tonight, describing his trip to the Far East as a journey for the winds of freedom. But upon his arrival in Bali today, there was a development that seemed to fly in the face of that description. 
three journalists and the president's entourage, fully accredited, were ordered to leave the country, apparently because of stories critical of President Suharto and the Indonesian government. Security was tight, even as President, and, uh, president Reagan and the First Lady were honored with an elaborate reception inside the stone gates of Bali. Mr. Reagan will remain uh, there for the rest of the day. He'll rest the remainder of the day. And on Thursday, he meets with foreign ministers of ASEA, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Tonight, there is a new U.S. aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. The nuclear-powered Enterprise replaces the Coral Sea. It steamed into Suez Canal at dawn today. The Enterprise will join the America within striking distance of Libya. The Big E's deck is crammed with warplanes and also with huge AWACS jets, which can control airborne strikes at enemy targets. As for the Coral Sea, it is going home. The Coral Sea has taken part in both U.S. attacks on Libya. Just even as the U.S. bolsters its defense capabilities in the Mediterranean, there was an emotional plea today for world peace at the funeral of a slain American hostage. 62-year-old Peter Kilburn was buried today in a military funeral at the San Francisco National Cemetery in the Presidio. Kilburn was found shot to death in Beirut on April 17th in apparent retaliation for the U.S. bombing of Libya. Kilburn spent 20 years as a librarian at the American University in Beirut. At the close of the service, Kilburn's nephew said, People of Lebanon, of whatever fate, we ask you to put down your arms and seek peace with your brothers and sisters. It was supposed to be a silent service for the victims of the space shuttle disaster, but nothing today could mask the sound of the sobs and the tears. The seven heroes took their last flight together to the Air Force Base in Delaware, from which they will go home for individual burial. Thousands of sobbing space workers lined the tarmac to say their last goodbyes. There were no speeches, no bands, just private thoughts and private tears. Soldiers and civilians alike stood stiffly to attention as the jet taxied down the runway. Ironically, the runway built for happy landings of the space shuttles. The jet touched down at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware late this afternoon on the final leg of its journey home. This has been a day for fires. That library fire downtown, but tra tragedy struck in Pomona with a fire early this morning. A smoldering fire broke out in a small home there, killing a mother and two of her children. Neighbors were awakened to the screams of family members, but rescuers had difficulty getting to them because of bars and windows on uh, bars on the doors and windows. Miriam Hernandez has this report. It was the worst kind of home fire, a killer, not because of flames, but because of smoke, and what Chief John Hawthorne calls a senseless oversight. And if, if there would have been one $6 operating smoke detector in this house, they could have walked out. And there's just, there's no reason for these people to die. It's just, it's criminal. The fire started in an overstuffed chair. It smoldered all night. Intense heat and smoke crept into the bedrooms. A layer of soot left a grim silhouette of young victims who never woke up. There's his foot right there. There's his head, his ear in detail, his nose, his mouth was open. This boy was probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 10. A child was laying on the carpet. You can see where the smoke built down and smoked the carpet where he wasn't. It's a definite silhouette. It's probably uh, a kid maybe between 8 and 11 years old. As you can see by this wall, the smoke was very thick. Firefighters had a hard time seeing anyone inside. After five people were pulled out from the front of the house, they thought that was everyone. It was a neighbor, Wynette Brandon, who told them someone else was trapped. He says, well, all we have is the mother and three boys. I said, there's another one in the back bedroom. Go after him. So he's, OK, so they ran around the back and got another boy. You knew the family well. I was over here last night. We're going somewhere this morning. <laughs> Dead are Cheryl Williams and her two boys, Charles 16 and Jeffrey 3. Two others are in intensive care. Another was treated and released. Neighbors pulled him out before firefighters arrived. From Pomona, Miriam Hernandez, Channel 2 News. Neighbors were the first to arrive at the scene of that fire, and fire department officials praised them as heroes. Mitchell Powers and Joe Johnson broke down the front door and managed to rescue 17-year-old Eric Hinton, a friend of the family's. Just we have the latest now on baby James. He is that 15-month-old infant 
who received a heart transplant last weekend. He is improving today. Doctors at Loma Linda University Hospital upgraded his condition from critical to fair. Hospital spokesman told us he has also been removed from a respi respirator and he has a good appetite. Baby James's parents, in fact, who have not been identified, got to hold him for the first time since the operation. Also, an infant they called Baby Rachel got a new heart at the same hospital this morning. Baby Rachel is three and a half months old. You remember you first met her when her mother made a public appeal for a donor heart. Baby Rachel's own heart was underdeveloped. Tonight she is listed in critical condition, but as we told you yesterday, that is routine for any heart patient the day of the operation. We just called Loma Linda Hospital. The spokesman there tell us that baby girl, baby Rachel, is doing just fine this evening. That's great news. We'll have more good news. McClovio has a decent weather forecast for us right after this. Hey, Marty, you seen the monthly receipts? No. How are we doing? Oh, beautiful. Frankie's spending money on Meisterbrow like it's going out of style. It's a quality beer. It's expensive. Oh, yeah? Solly at the Kit Kat says it ain't expensive. Says it just tastes expensive. So? So. What's that little weasel doing with the dough, Ray Me? He's spinning on the beer. Baby, that mink is making you look like a fox. <laughs> Rich, smooth Meisterbrow. It only tastes expensive. Adrian Arpel, I need help. Well, you've come to the right place. Just give us two hours to make you over. First, a honey and almond facial scrub and a skin vacuuming. Next, a warm collagen protein mask. Now, a makeup and lesson. Then our stylist cuts and reshapes your hair. Well, Lauren, what do you think? Adrian Arpel, I just love you. This week only, Adrian Arpel makeover, just $30 at Saks Fifth Avenue Beauty Salons. Call for an appointment. The Challenge. Take a Buick Somerset that hits over 150 miles per hour on the track and tame it for the streets of California. The answer? Three liters of fuel-injected V6 guts. Shelby wheels with Eagle GTs. Front wheel drive. Inside, leather-wrapped wheels, stereo cassette, everything. Add a front air dam, side rocker panels, and a spoiler to an aerodynamic body with a grand touring suspension. It's the Somerset Special Edition. Only at your California Buick dealers. There's a lot of this in every one of these. Time now for a look at our weather. We've been promised a good forecast, and since we're sort of in dire need of good news today, let's go right to Matt. Why do we have rocks on the news set? Um, it tends to get a little windy out here when the oh. weather comes along, so we use it to hold down our papers. There we go. We, we, we won't need any rocks to hold anything outside because pleasant weather is in store for the Southland for the next couple of days. It's decent. It's maybe even better than decent. It's very nice out there. Temperatures will stay in the upper 70s for the next couple of days with... Uh, the possibility of the desert areas because it's looking a lot like summer out there with temperatures moving on up into the high 90s. Today in the Southland, we have a live shot of Chopper 2, and you can see that uh, there is quite a bit of haze in the atmosphere, but there were no first stage health alerts. 77 was our maximum, 62 the low, and 56% humidity, pressures 29.92. As I mentioned, no first stage health alerts, none are forecast for tomorrow, so good air quality is in store for the Southland. Even though it looked kind of hazy out there, the, there is no real inversion. The marine layer is very thick, and as a result, there's good mixing of the air in our particular environment. There is a low out here in the mid-Pacific. Uh, it, it will be moving on to the west coast, but certainly not affecting us. These high clouds down here out of the tropics may drift over our area, not enough to really mess up our weather. Here's a national map. Fair out in the west coast and fairly nice on the east coast. A few scattered thunder showers in the nation's midsection. The current weather map will show the uh, isolated activity is occurring down in south Texas and on up in the central plains. This little frontal system kind of washed out as it moved through our area. For uh, Wednesday, we're looking at all of the heavy activity to occur in the central part of the country. Fair weather on the east and on the west. By Wednesday afternoon, that line of showers moves over the Mississippi Valley, while most of the western states will have fairly nice weather. And by Thursday, that frontal system that I showed you offshore, well, it starts moving in. Here's the local forecast for the Southland tonight. Very pleasant out there. We're looking for the clouds to thicken up after midnight, and we're looking for a low of 59 degrees. Tomorrow, we're looking for low clouds in the morning and then hazy sun in the afternoon hours with the high temperatures ranging around 79 degrees. And for Thursday, no major changes. In fact, our high should be around 80 degrees. Things uh, are looking pretty good here. Overnight lows in the mid-50s and we'll stay generally near the 80 degree mark for the balance of this week uh, with um, maybe a slight cooling trend the latter part of the week. By and large, temperatures not changing more than three or four degrees, so things are looking pretty good. The EPA in uh, San Francisco is the authority for 
all of the radiation uh, concern that there is out there, and they're saying that uh, the atmosphere will dilute and disperse much of that, and that we should be a little bit comforted that um, we're not going to be really affected by that, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not as much as the folks uh, near Kiev and those Russian cities. And of course, as we said earlier, we have an expert a little later in Absolutely. the newscast who will address all of that. Absolutely. Everyone is talking about it, and so I felt compelled to say something about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. There's much more news still ahead here live at 5, so stay with us. Columbia, 1858. Hey, buddy, how are you doing? You got gold for sale, right? I can give you the best price in California. Hey, mister, you can get a much better deal over here. <laughs> for over 133 years, Wells Fargo's come through with a fair shake for Californians. 1850 an ounce. That's what it's worth. That's what I'll pay. Done. Wells Fargo Bank, still coming through today. In the 1950s, the modern gas barbecue was developed. We just think it's super deluxe. Though cleaning was a minor problem. In the 1960s, cleaning took even less time. Right on. In the 70s, because of new, improved detergents, cleaning time was dramatically reduced. But isn't it time for real change? Self-clean by the Happy Cooker. The first self-cleaning gas barbecue. Self-clean by the Happy Cooker. We don't make barbecues the way they used to. When you put the red carpet sign in front of your house, we'll really get into selling it. With our season knowledge and experience, we can really get into selling your house. With professional sales tools and techniques, we can really get into selling your house. With powerful advertising and a network referral service to attract more buyers to your house. We're the oldest full-service real estate franchise in America. Call Red Carpet. Let's get into it. Red Carpet, we really get into selling your house. Taste your new Friskies Buffet, because I love that Frisky cat. I'm a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday kind of cat. But they feed me like the weekend every day. Hey, I'm a famous, far-out, fickle, funny, Frisky kind of cat. And that's why they feed me Frisky's Buffet. It's because they love me, yeah. Frisky's Buffet, with that great new taste. Which way to the buffet? If you're just now joining us, the top story around the world tonight is the nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union. One unconfirmed report claims 2,000 people have died in the meltdown at the Chernobyl power plant. Even Moscow is calling the crisis a disaster. A radioactive cloud was detected in Sweden, 1,000 miles away from that nuclear plant, a cloud which is expected to reach our west coast by this weekend. U.S. officials say there is no danger here, but the fallout could poison a major Soviet watershed and contaminate the Ukrainian wheat fields, often called the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. The body of a woman found in the back seat of a car in Fullerton may be that of a policeman's wife missing for a week. Police say the body was in the back seat of the car and was so badly decomposed that no immediate identification could be made. But the car matches the description of the one owned by Marie Malgren, a 38-year-old Brea woman. She was last seen Tuesday as she drove her children to school. A devastating fire has ruined one of the great treasures of Los Angeles. The main downtown library is still smoldering at this hour. Thousands and thousands of books are known to be destroyed by the fire which broke out just before noon today. However, there is some good news about this. We're told some of the rare books may have been saved. Calling time now for sports. Jim Hill has just joined us, and this was the day of the big draft. It certainly was, and Bo Jackson was right up at the top. It's only appropriate that he goes to the Bucks because he's going to make a lot of bucks down there. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers kicked off the 1986 NFL draft of college players early this morning by selecting Heisman Trophy winner Bo Jackson and promising to present him with the top offer in the history of that draft. Now, the brilliant Auburn running back averaged more than six and a half yards per carry in his four years with the Tigers and was rated by some as the best running prospect since O.J. Simpson. The Bucks will have to come up with their top bucks in order to keep Jackson a career in Major League Baseball. Now, Oklahoma nose tackle Tony Casillas is on his way to the Atlanta Falcons. The Oilers used their number three pick in the, in the first round to select quarterback Jim Everett from Purdue. Alabama defensive end John Hand goes to the Indianapolis Colts. While a surprise of the draft came in the first round, the St. Louis Cardinals used the top pick on Michigan State running back Anthony Bell. Meanwhile, the Rams had the 23rd selection in the first round, and they surprised a lot of people by choosing Mike Schott, a 6-foot, 5-inch, 290-pound offensive lineman from Queens College in Ontario, Canada. 
In addition to his size, Shad has great speed, and some experts say he's the best player to ever come out of Canada. When I was at USC, I thought Anthony Munoz was the standard that you know, was, was not the standard, but rare. I look at this man from some of the physical things he can do, not just standing there, but movement. We don't judge people on, on you know, in, in a statuesque pose, but we do on movement, and we feel the same way about him. Now, in the second round, the Rams picked guard Tom Newberry from Wisconsin lacrosse, then dealt quarterback Jeff Kemp and two fourth-round selections to the San Francisco 49ers for their third choice, which the Rams used to select the man they feel will be the signal call of the future, Washington's Hugh Millen. Now, the Raiders also went for a big lineman in the first round, six foot four inch 271-pound defensive end Bob Bukowski from the University of Pittsburgh. I just felt that uh, uh, he was a good choice for the Raiders, for the organization, because of his style of play, his toughness and his aggressiveness and his ability to, uh, to play all over the field. After Bukowski, the Raiders didn't have a choice until the third round when they selected Michigan defensive back Brad Cochran. Now, if you're one of the players who are waiting around to be selected today, the NFL draft can be a battle of nerves, as I found out early this morning. Draft day for USC's James Fitzpatrick began as it did for hundreds of other young athletes around the country today. Up at the crack of dawn, watching, waiting, and hoping. I've always just said I'd like to stay on the West Coast. You get your hopes set up for, for something like that, and, and you always get let down. So I'm like, I'm... And as the morning progressed, it looked like the 280-pound offensive tackle might get his wish. Eleven picks had gone by. Detroit was next, then San Diego. And Fitzpatrick's attorney, Lee Steinberg, really seemed to have a good handle on what was about to happen. If your toy goes with Long, then Fitz goes to San Diego. This is Lee's idea of a practical joke, you see. This is, <laughs> you're going to Buffalo, James. <laughs> Steinberg, however, had done his homework well. Long did go to Detroit, and Fitzpatrick anxiously awaited the Chargers pick. San Diego, San Diego Chargers select tackle Southern California, James Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Your initial reaction right now, Fitz? The whole time, I just thought it was too good to be true, you know, and, uh, you know, I thought, you know, there'd be something that would happen, and I just didn't want to get my hopes too high, and, uh, you know, now that it's happened, you know, I'm just uh, ecstatic. What do you have to say to your teammates out at SC now who thought you were going to go to Buffalo or someplace like that? Past the suntan motion, you know, <laughs> it's just like... Uh, <laughs> Speaking of pass, that's exactly what he'll be doing, pass protecting for Dan Fouts down with the Chargers. He should be a good one. Now, Fitzpatrick wasn't the only local star to get an important phone call this morning. The Dallas Cowboys used their top pick for UCLA wide receiver Mike Sherrard. All-American kicker John Lee goes to the St. Louis Cardinals. The Bruins' Mark Whalen joins his teammate Sherrard in Big D, while Fullerton defensive back Mark Collins is headed for the New York Giants. Now, as we reported last night, USC head basketball coach George Raffling has recommended to the school's athletic committee that the scholarships of freshman Tom Lewis, Bo Kimball, and Hank Gathers not be renewed. The three talented first-year players were considered the core of the USC attack for the future, but all three spoke publicly of transferring if they were given no say in choosing a replacement for Stan Morrison, who resigned at the end of the season. According to Raveling, all three players missed the deadline he set to declare their invitations and rather their intentions for the 86 and the 87 campaign. Kimball and Gathers are reportedly headed for Pepperdine, while Lewis is said to be considering UC Irvine. All three players will be ineligible for at least one year. Let's look at sports for now. Jess Cullen. Thank you, Jim. Coming up at 6 o'clock on Heart of the Matter, the dangers of living in the nuclear age. Can a deadly nuclear meltdown, such as the one in the Soviet Union, happen in California? Or have we learned the lessons of Three Mile Island? question that needs close examination. That's tonight on Heart of the Matter in our 6 o'clock broadcast a little after 6.30. Let's see what else is coming up at 6. For that, we go to John Schubeck, who is live in the newsroom right now. John? Colleen, thank you very much. Coming up in about 20 minutes, we'll have a live update on that fire at the historic downtown library. Plus, the nuclear disaster in the Soviet Union is having an impact here in Los Angeles and generally in the United States. We'll tell you how radiation fallout from the meltdown in the Ukraine could affect your health and how it is affecting the stock market as well is the story tonight. We'll detail that for you. We'll also have part two of our special report on the Star Wars defense plan. Some say it is a billion-dollar-plus idea that will never get off the ground. All that and more coming up at 6. See you then. Thank you. Thank you, John. We'll continue live at 5 right after this. <laughs> where do you want to go for lunch? I know where I want to go for lunch. I don't want to spend a lot of money. Not 
fast food. Definitely not fast food. Sizzler. I don't want to spend a lot of money. So where to? Sizzler. Sizzler. So where do you want to go for lunch tomorrow? How about Paris? I don't want to spend a lot of money. The word on the street is hot. Controversial. Provocative. Different. Bold. The word on the street is West 57. Season premiere Wednesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain. Until now, basic transportation was boring. Welcome to 1987 Nissan Sentras. The all-new Sentras are longer. And they're wider for a big car ride. There are five new Sentras to choose from, including Nissan's sleek new Sentra Sport Coupe. Bye-bye, basics. Hello, Sentra. Who made their most affordable car even better? The name is Nissan, America's number one selling import car. I'd like you to know why I love the daily news. Information, entertainment, parade, L.A. life, and L.A.'s most complete TV book, Daily News. I met one guy in the valley who didn't read the Daily News. I forget his name. Garfield. Dennis McCarthy. Ann Landers. The Daily News. The only major newspaper completely committed to the valley. But you already knew that. I hope. Reports out of the Soviet Union on the nuclear disaster there are sketchy officials there calling for help putting out an atomic fire, which could be considered more dangerous than a nuclear meltdown. And confirmed reports say thousands may be dead or injured from radiation poisoning. To better try to understand what's going on now in the Soviet Union at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, Dr. James Worf joins us now. He is professor of chemistry, an expert on nuclear energy and nuclear power plants. And professor, you also spent five and a half years on the Manhattan Project. Could you at that time have, have conceived of, of the anxiety the world is suffering today? No, the world was too occupied with even more anxious issues at the time. And indeed, uh, Hiroshima was more... Uh, uh, naturally, of yes, course. Yes. Uh, I just say as a preparatory statement that however dangerous nuclear reactors are, it's infinitesimal in comparison to the weapons. And you, uh, you're currently working on a book trying to describe, uh, explain to the layperson, both weapons and, uh, and nuclear energy. That's generally. right. This, this little work develops a history, how we got ourselves into this mess, you might say, a little bit on the technical vocabulary, the reactors, weapons, what a war would mean, peaceful applications, that sort of thing. You acknowledge this is a mess? Well, uh, by mess, what I meant was the nuclear arms race. Mm. Dr. Worf, we have heard that there is a radioactive cloud that is, is emanating from the Soviet Union. We've, in fact, heard that it may hit the United States, especially the West Coast. We've heard it's not dangerous. Do you hold with that well, theory? Well, the word not means absolutely not, and of course, these are all relative. My view is that it is extremely small and nothing really to worry about. But what about pregnant women? And I noticed there were some of them, in fact, around the newsroom today who were especially worried about it. They're told not to get x-rays or anything like that. Should they take any kind of special precautions? Well, not yet, by no means. Uh, see, the cloud hasn't even reached the United States But yet. assuming that it does... All right. Uh, it's still, though, the level of activity measured by the Swedes is very small. They estimated that in the time that the cloud resided in, the, in their country, each person got about four to six millirems of exposure, which would be something like uh, a chest x-ray or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, pregnant women often get chest x-rays. I would not r recommend a uterine x-ray, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I feel that the level is just simply too small to worry about too much. But in that in that specific area, knowing what you know about that kind of, of meltdown, that kind of, of resulting graphite fire, is it conceivable to you that only two people could have lost their lives? Uh, I, I, would, I would think that is a gross underestimate. 
On the other hand, the other estimate I have heard... Of 2,000. Yeah. Mm. Does that seem an exaggeration? It might be. It's just a question, you see, of the density of the workers nearby and the parameters of the accident, and we just don't have enough information on that. Can you tell us a little bit about the iodine pills that we're hearing about so much? A lot of times people hear about radiation and they figure if you're exposed to it, you have no recourse. Now we're hearing about radiation medication and iodine pills. All right. Uh, I, I prefer the chemist's pronunciation of iodine. Nevertheless, it isn't iodine or iodine. That is a reddish brown material sold as a tincture. You shouldn't drink much of that. What you're referring to is potassium iodide, a white colorless salt taken in water, a fraction of a gram per day, saturates the thyroid gland in its ability to take up iodine. Consequently, any radioactive iodine that comes in at the same time, why that is simply rejected, and it's a way then of protecting the thyroid against assimilation of the radioactive iodine. So you saturate the system. That's right. But you'd, you'd warn against any self-medication, especially from anyone who stands so little risk as we apparently do in this area. Uh, I haven't... I wouldn't dream of taking it now. <laughs> okay. No. Thank you very much for coming yes. in and helping us out and, and explaining it in layman's terms, which well, is often so difficult. Thank you very much. There is much more news still ahead here live at 5, so stay with us. Can you see okay? Yeah. Peanuts! Get your fresh roasted peanuts! Two. Want some peanuts? Yeah. Remember fresh roasted peanuts?